grab a Bible and join us in the book of Revelation. That's where we are on Sunday mornings. We're making our way verse by verse through this book. We are in Revelation chapter 2, so hopefully you have brought a Bible, you're making your way there. There are Bibles around you and chairs nearby. If you didn't bring one, grab one of those with, again, the hope that through God's Word, He would speak into your life the things that He has. In the midst of Revelation, this book we're doing, we're kind of doing a series within a series. We're doing the seven churches of Revelation right now, Revelation 2 and 3, and in the midst of that, one of the things we've been doing that we don't usually do and probably won't keep doing is provide you a note sheet. It's there in your bulletin. If you don't have it, you can grab it out of that. If you didn't grab one and you want one, would you raise your hands right now and our ushers and greeters will bring you one. If you need a pen and you don't have one, hold your hand up and they'll bring you one. All right, over here. Again, you don't have to use this, but it is there with some intention of making it helpful and clear, and we hope that it would. Online, it's available for you. If you don't have it, you can go to our website and find that there under the messages, and hopefully that would be helpful. Well, let's ask God to meet us in his word. Let's ask him to take it and give it to us in a way that we get it. Would you join me? Father, thank you that you have given us your word. Your word shines like a light in a dark place. May it shine into our lives and into our world now. Would you work in it that which you've intended, and would you draw us to you most of all? Lord, would you take your your word and just help us to get it? Would you grant us favor and help that we would hear what you're saying to us? Individually, together we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Your greatest need is to see Jesus. I mean, that's what the Bible holds out to us from one cover to the other, that we should consider Jesus, that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, that our request should be that. And that is just essentially and wonderfully true. But it's also so exciting for us right now. Because though that's always true, it's the stated purpose of the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.1 tells us that this book was given to us to help us to see Jesus, to reveal Jesus to us. And if you're getting that, then you're getting it. If you get that from this morning, if you see Jesus better than you have before, then that is exactly what you need to see. And it's right there where our letter even begins. Every one of the seven letters that are here begin with a section where Jesus, in addressing that specific church, takes and reveals a part of his character to them, takes and shows them who he is. So let's begin this letter and note with me there in verse 18, where Jesus tells this church and us a little bit about himself. Verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who uh, has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Jesus wants them, he wants you and I to see things, and he tells us three things. He tells us, okay, this is the Son of God. He says, these things says the Son of God. The one who has eyes, he says, like a flame of fire, who has feet like fine brass. These are word pictures that are given to you and I to think through, and these, especially the latter two, and yet through them to be just clear and understanding who Jesus is. So what are they? Well, the Son of God, that's a title that just points to Jesus as God, as the Son of God authoritatively. This isn't a diminutive title. In fact, it's connecting to that. In fact, we see that in the Bible. I think back in John 5 when Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees there, and it says, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, or their version of it, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. I just want you just to see that. By by saying that he's the Son of God, it is making him equal with God. That's how they understood it, and they're right. When Jesus uses this term, it's not saying that, you know, that he's a lesser or a deputy or anything like that that some people have come up with. He is God. 
And, and to make this a statement is an amazing statement. In fact, here in the book of Revelation, this is the only time this title is used. This is the only time that we find it, right here. And so it stands in just stark, just, hey, this is who he is, uh, that he is speaking with authoritative, uh, an authoritative voice, that he is speaking as God. That's important. But it also shows him and pictures him as if he has eyes, like a flame of fire. Again, it's a word picture. It's not really saying that's what his eyes look like, but it's helping you and I see something. What is it we're supposed to see? That Jesus has, if you will, piercing vision. That he has all seeing. That the idea is, is absolutely just gazing into it and with a, a way of just burning through anything else that would just be hindering. He sees the reality of what it is. I think about how Hebrews would tell it to us of God. It says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It's just a reminder that when we think about God, he is not in any way confused. He sees things. He sees things for how they really are. He has never bamboozled. He can never, you know, misguess. What he sees is an accurate perception. He has, if I can say it this way, no rose-colored glasses when he looks at us. You know what we mean by that, right? I mean, there are times that we can kind of paint things with our own perspective and not really see things for how they are. That's not the eyes that he has. What he's wanting us to know is that he has this penetrating. It's like, I know. <laughs> I see exactly what's taking place. And that's scary and helpful and good all at the same time. But he adds to it, not only does he have this penetrating vision, these eyes like a flame of fire, in this image, and it's taken a little bit from Revelation chapter 1 when John turns around and sees Jesus, and he sees this image, and he looks and he says he has feet like fine brass. What's that communicating? Well, I'll say it this way, that he is actively disciplining sin. What do you mean? Well, brass, it's a metal that's used all the way through the Bible. And when it's used, it's used as dealing with sin. You could go back to the tabernacle and temple in the Old Testament, and where you find gold, that's always where God's presence is. Gold is a, is a reminder of God's presence. Where you find silver, that's where worship is taking place and rising. But where you find brass or bronze, that is where sin is being dealt with. Whether you'd have it on the bronze altar or the bronze laver or elements of, of being that sometimes brass has the idea of this is where sin is being fixed, where this is sin is being atoned, but other times it's where sin is being dealt with, where you'll find times where a king is carried away in brass you know, shackles, just this picture of judgment that happens to like the king of Israel when they're conquered by Babylon, and brass becomes this picture of where it is that of being dealt with, and I put to you that that's what it's showing us here. Jesus having these feet like fine brass, it's not a way that's saying he's, this is where sin is dealt with as far as forgiven or paid for, but it's the idea that he's stepping into situations. His feet like fine brass is him saying that he's one that does step into these things. I think about what Proverbs tells us. It says, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. It tells us about parenting. It says, you know, if, you, if you're not going to discipline your kids, it says it's not really a sign of love. What I want you to see in Jesus is he's telling us what these brass feet is he's willing that he is one that steps into dealing with sin, that he's not one that ignores what's taking place. He's not one that doesn't deal with sin. He's saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. So you put that together as a package, and we would say kind of as a summary that what Jesus is revealing to this church and to us through this church is that he is a divine, all-seeing judge. Perhaps the important question for you right now is, is that how you see Jesus? I mean, is this like, oh yeah, of course. I mean, that's, that's, that's my Jesus. That's, that's the Jesus I know. 
Or could it be here this morning that you have created a false representation of Jesus that you're like, well, my Jesus, he's, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He doesn't ever, <laughs> he just, he's just kind of like this fatherly grand figure. He doesn't ever really ever deal with anything. Or do you see Jesus in him saying, I see, and I, I don't let things go on forever. I, I, I faithfully deal with my people. This is who I am, and, and this is an accurate representation. By the way, you might just want to open up your little booklet there for a moment, and you'll see that, again, as we're working through these churches, we are you know, trying to compile the whole list. So you can see all seven churches. If you were to write that one from today, you would see that Jesus, again, is a divine, all-seeing judge. But what I want you to do is just take a look across that column, because I want to remind you that what we're seeing about Jesus is who he is. He is not different. He doesn't change. So that in each one of these, what we're getting a glimpse of is who Jesus really is. That to the church of Ephesus, he told us he's a God who's involved with his people. He's a God who's actively involved in his church. To Smyrna, we saw that he's sovereign, that he's over life. He's over what's happening in our world. He's compassionate in our struggles, and he is the one who has conquered all pain and all sorrow. We saw in Pergamos that he is one that is connected to the word of God, that he has the word of God there, that this book represents him, and God wants us to make sure we see it that way. And then as we come again to Thyatira, we're seeing a divine, all-seeing judge. And again, I'm hoping that this is augmenting, this is helping, this is making you think, I just need to see Jesus better. I mean, if I'm getting one thing out of these letters, what I should be getting is this. It's like, that's that's my Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's who Jesus is. This is my Savior. This is the one I'm, I'm seeking. This is my hope, and I'm accurately leaning into that because that's the main aim, that we would see and know Jesus, and I'm hoping that throughout all we see this morning, it only becomes more clear. So, Jesus revealed. That's the most important thing. To this church, then, he takes this revelation of who he is, and he begins it, as he does in most of the letters, with a place of commendation, where he looks upon this church and tells us, okay, so what's good about this church in, in the list of churches? That's found for us there in verse 19. So you might just want to look there with me. Verse 19, Jesus says this, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. This section begins with those four words that begins this section in every one of the seven letters. Jesus says, I know. I know your works. And he tells us the things that are happening in this church. He says that they are a church that has love, that they are a church that is exercising that, that love is present. Love of God, love for people, that's everything, right? He tells us that they're a church that is serving. <laughs> I mean, they're just actively doing that. That there are people that are, are working in the midst of that and, and putting, you know, just action to their belief. There are people that have faith, that they believe, that they, they, they look upon and they hold to who Jesus is. There are people that have patience. Hupomone, a Greek word, this enduring, this just lasting, just wading into this, this thing. He says, that's what you guys have. And then he ends that commendation saying, you know, that as for your works, the last are more than the first. And the idea is it's a statement of saying they're growing. Their works are not, you know, staying stagnant, but they're improving. They're, 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 they're going in a, in a good direction. Now, we could spend a long time on this list, but I don't think it's actually necessary. I mean, these are words we understand, at least in part, that there's a sense we could look and say, hey, here's a, here's a church, and, and if you were to look at them, and you were to think, okay, what are they? Well, maybe you could just sum it up and say, here's a church that's just, and they're doing a lot of good. I mean, you would just get there. If this was a church that you attended, say, on a Sunday morning, you would find, like, man, this is, they, they love, they love God, they love people, they are so active, they, they have faith, they're patient, I mean, they're just, and they're just going and going, I mean, it's a really complimentary statement. I don't want you to miss that, but I also want to pull that into the theme of what we're talking about, because how is Jesus revealing himself to this church? As the judge? As the one who is a divine, all-seeing judge who's going to deal with the wrong that's there? 
And one of the fascinating things about just pausing and, and thinking about Jesus' commendation is how well he does this. That he is one who is able to, to judge his church, and he doesn't make the mistakes that we sometimes make. Oh, you know them, right? We tend to be a people who can use that proverbial expression, we can throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, we can find something wrong, and we can, we can just throw everything out. We can have a propensity of doing that. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus looks upon this church, and he's able to say, okay, I'm going to tell you what's wrong, but I can also tell you what's good. But neither is he blinded by that. Oh, it can happen. See, sometimes we can come to become the people that because we see good things, we ignore the bad. But Jesus is not one that does that. He's able to say, you know, I see the good, and that doesn't become, but they're doing a lot of good things. <laughs> I mean, like, that's the answer. Okay, yeah, there's some things that aren't great, but, but they're doing some really, really good things. You should see what they do in the community. They're, they're a loving people. They're a patient people. They're a faith-filled people. You know, Jesus is able to see that and commend it at the same moment where he's going to have to step in and bring incredible light uh, onto the things that are going wrong. And I, I just find this to be wonderful. I mean, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I wish I were more that way. I find in me the propensity to go one of the other two ways. I tend to be either the throw out the baby at the bathwater, it's like one bad thing, and it's like, okay, <laughs> we're just going to get rid of that. Or I can tend to be someone, but, you know, there's so many good things happening. How could I be critical? I mean, how, I mean, how could I be critical when I see all this good stuff? And I just want to tell you, I love our Savior who is able to speak so clearly. He's able to look on this church and commend them for what is good at the same way as he's going to diagnose what's wrong, which is where we move next, where Jesus wants to look on this church and he's going to tell us, hey, this is what's wrong. He's going to diagnose, speaking that truth in love, identifying what's wrong. Hey, this is found in verses 20 to 23, so let's read those. So you got your Bibles there. Begin with me in verse 20. Nevertheless, it's an ominous beginning, right? It's like, you guys are doing a lot of good. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Okay. Wow. I mean, I don't know about you, but those are like, I and mean, if you're just paying attention, even just to reading, it's like, okay, those are right. That's just, this is a little bit, yeah, this is heavy because that's really where we are. And he begins it by telling us that they're allowing a Jezebel to teach. You, you might know what that is, but let's just begin understanding that. What do we mean Jezebel? If you are unfamiliar with your Bible, this might not be immediately apparent, but let me just tell you, this is an Old Testament picture which is what he's doing in Revelation. He's taking pictures that are found in our Old Testament and tracing them. And Jezebel, well, she's one of those names. Kind of like Judas in the New Testament, Hitler in our history. Just the name by itself should speak volumes. Who is Jezebel? Well, she is the wife of King Ahab over Israel who stirs him up to do wickedly. And I just give you a couple of verses. First Kings tells us about Ahab it says, now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. If you know your Israel history, Israel splits into two nations for a period of time. The southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is Israel. The southern kingdom at this point is Judah. And Israel goes bad. I mean, it just goes really, really bad in the northern kingdom. And each king gets almost seemingly worse than the others till they get to like the worst of the worst, which is Ahab. And God just makes this statement, and it's, a, it's just pregnant with just a weight to it. 
He says, now Ahab, the son of Omri, he did worse in the sight of the Lord, more than all the who were before him. He's the worst king yet. He did worse than anybody else had done in Israel at that point in time. And I'm just going to tell you, that's just like, wow. I mean, I'm just singling it out there. And it tells us this, it says, and it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which is one of the lies that began to turn the northern kingdom away, just some idolatry they began to set up in their kingdom. It says as though that wasn't enough, that he took as wife Jezebel. That's our, that's our lady, right? You guys are paying attention. He took his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshiped him. So as if it wasn't enough just to do the rebellion, he takes this foreign wife, which was biblically he wasn't supposed to do, and she does exactly what God said would happen. She brings her idolatry in. She brings the, the worship of Baal into Israel. In fact, it goes on in, second, in 1 Kings 21 and says it to us this way. It says, there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Now, that's, again, what I'm asking you to see. And I just, I just want you to feel the weight of it. Because there just wasn't anybody. I mean, in, in God's perfect sight, which is somewhat we're talking about, Jesus with these penetrating eyes that accurately sees, says that in God's sight, there was not anybody who did wicked like this guy did. And one of the reasons he did that is because he allows, because Jezebel, his wife, encourages him and stirs him up to do wickedness. I just want you to feel that. I just want you to feel what that is, because when you hear Jezebel, that's what you should think of. This is, this is, this is the biblical weight to that, that name. Jezebel. When you, when you say, okay, that's a Jezebel, what is that? Oh, that is, that, that's the person that stirs up wickedness, encourages wickedness, leads people astray. That, that's what that word should mean. As, as, as much as Judas, again, should just immediately strike of a betrayer, Jezebel, she is one that, she, she's the one that stirs him up to do wickedness. And so, just to make that statement here, Let's us know that that's what this is. And then he tells us a few things about her. So let's just, again, note it there just so you see it in the text. Verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Let's just unpack that little section there and try to wrap our minds about who this is. Who is this Jezebel? Well, for starters, it says, here's what you're doing. You're allowing this. He says, because, here's my thing, you're allowing this to happen. That's what he's writing to this church. For you guys who've been tracking with us, this is more than the sin of Pergamos. There are some similarities. If you were here last week, we, we saw the sin of Pergamos, and actually the two things that she is encouraging were actually there also in Pergamos but it's worse now. Where in Pergamos, it says you just have there those who hold this. Now it seems to be something that's become just permeating, and you're allowing it. You're just, you're allowing this to happen. You're allowing that to be there in your life. Hold on to that. Come back to that in a second. It says she calls herself a prophetess. She calls herself a prophetess. What is this? Well, please understand, it's not wrong that a woman would be a prophet. Again, I just want to make that clear at the beginning. It's not because she's a woman. That has nothing to do with this. We are those who biblically believe that a woman should not be a pastor of a church and just believe that that's both held strongly in the New Testament history, all of that. That's a different thing. But prophets, yeah, yeah. We have it in the Old Testament. We have Deborah, who's a prophet. In the New Testament, we have Philip's daughters, who are prophets, so it's, it's possible for a woman to, to be one that is that. That's not the problem. Don't let your mind go there. But the problem is that she's not. She's calling herself a prophet. What's a prophet? One who says, I'm speaking for God. I have a message for you from God and, and says, okay, she's doing this. 
But the thing is, God says here, she calls herself a prophet. God does not. The problem is that she has put herself in a role that God has not put her there. She's not speaking for him is what God is saying. So she, she says she's speaking for me. She is not speaking for me. That is not my voice. That is not my message. And she is misleading people in my name. That's the key. It could have been a woman, literally, in the church. Or it could have been a movement. Or, or just, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just saying any of those things. The point is it's a false message. It's a false message. It's not speaking for God. Well, what is she doing then? Well, she's teaching. That's what he says here. She is teaching. She's doing this. She's teaching these two errors that she's going to go on to say. She's instructing them in two errors that really will be destructive. In fact, you might just want to notice it again in verse 20. It says, because, just in the middle of verse 20, you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, God does not, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, to eat things sacrificed to idols. So she's introducing something. It is a false teaching. It is bringing in instruction into a church, teaching them things that is not true. And we're trying to wrap our minds around this, and it's an interesting thing just in the midst of this. God's going to go on and define it even further in verse 24. Would you gaze down there with me? In verse 24, he says it to us this way when he's giving his encouragement to them. He says, now to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, doctrine means teaching, that you're, you're not buying into the teaching that Jezebel's been bringing, who you don't have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. Now, just pause there for a second. So that's the God's de definition. He's looking on what Jezebel's bringing in or this woman or this teacher or this movement that's bringing this into this church. And he says, this thing, it's, it's the depths of Satan, as they say. What does that mean? What does it mean, the depths of Satan? Well, we're not entirely certain. There are a few possibilities, and all of them are things that have been used in the church over history. So we could say, okay, it might be that. It could be that it's a lie of embracing sin to know God. Early Gnosticism in those days had begun to creep in and basically said it doesn't really matter what you do. You know, it's an, your, your, your actions don't affect your soul. Then there were some that went so far as to say, you know, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. So if you want to know God's grace, you need to sin more. And you sit there and think, well, that, would that ever happen, Jim? I wish I could tell you that it never happens. I, I, I have videos I can find online of people teaching that today. And it's terrible. It could be that. It could be saying that she's teaching them this, saying that this is the depths of Satan, that it's, a, it's calling us to do wrong to get right, which would never be God. Or maybe it's a word play. It is possible that God is saying something here, and he's doing it kind of in a mocking tone, that Instead of saying it's the depths of Satan, they were calling it the depths of God. See, one of the ways that lies have entered into the church over history is that people like, well, so what, how are you, what are you teaching? What, what's this new, new doctrine you're saying? And you know, where's that in the Bible? You know, what is that, where do we find that? And they'll say things, oh, well, you know, the Bible, that's kind of like for beginners. But now we're into the deep things of God. We're now past Scripture. We're going into deep territory. We're, we're going into deep territory, and, and we're leaving that behind. And that kind of lie has opened up the door to a lot of things, and we know that was present even in the first century. And so it's possible that God is saying, hey, that's what it is. You're, you're, you're bringing in this lie that is that. Or maybe, you know, one of the things we've challenged is saying, okay, whenever you find a picture here, it's probably coming somewhere else in the Bible. And the only place that we could find this really is Satan's epic lie and his horrible fall. See, it's found there in Isaiah 14. Some of you are familiar with it. God is speaking to Satan and, and talking about him. And he says, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You are cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations. And that, that might be worth just noting there because that's what Jezebel did, right? She encouraged sin. He says, you're the one that's weakening the nations. You're the one that's done that. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. 
God, in a fasting waiting way, takes us into Satan's motivation. It was pride. It was this selfishness. I'm going to be, I'm going to be like God. I'm going to push myself up. And then God just tells him, but you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. This is probably the closest place we can find in the Old Testament that we would say this is the deep things of Satan. This is the, the, the depths of Satan. This is where he is cast. And God looks upon him and says, this is where it's going. This is your destruction. You are not going to succeed. You're going to fail. This is not where you, you are not heading towards success. You are heading towards destruction. And so it could be that when it's making this description here, it's telling us that one way or another, it is a lie. It is a false teaching. And that's what you need to catch right now. Whatever this is, whatever this doctrine is, it's a lie. And this Jezebel was bringing it into the church in Thyatira. What's it doing? Well, it's seducing. The Greek word literally means to cause to wander, to, to cause people to go astray. It, it's to lead them. It says, you're, you're taking and you're causing people to do that. And God says, who? My servants. You're messing up my servants, hindering, hurting God's people. Again, that's what God says. Can, can we read it one more time? Just there in verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Again, it tells us that there was nobody like Ahab, who did such wickedness in the sight of the Lord, and he does so because of Jezebel. He does so because Jezebel stirs him up, and we think about all of that. We just want to make sure we see this, but can I just bring this to responsibility before you? The essence of this, in one sense, is God is calling you not to allow this in your life, because that's what he's saying. You're allowing this. You are allowing Jezebel to lead you astray. And the Bible tells us that you have a responsibility, that false teaching, it's present. We have the entire book of Jude. We have 2 Peter chapter 3. We have Paul warning about it in Acts. We have it in Corinthians. We have it over and over and over where God is telling you, hey, if you're going to be a Christian and you're going to walk in God's ways, then one of the things you're going to have to deal with is that there are going to be things that are taught in God's name, that are wrong, and you're supposed to avoid them. I love the passage in Acts where it simply says they received the word that Paul was teaching with all readiness, and then they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. God holds this as a model for you. Hey, you should listen. I, I hope you're listening readily to, to me, but I hope you're also not just swallowing it because I say it. I hope you're like, well, I'm going to go and read that later and make sure that's really what it says because my standard of truth is never a man. My standard is God's word. And you should never be someone that just buys into something because it sounds good or because it's presented well or <laughs> they like, you like what's being said necessarily. It should be like, I just need to know. I need to be aware that there are things that could lead me astray. And I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't want to allow that in my life. I don't want to allow those voices to encourage me in wrong. So that's his first part of this is he's diagnosing us. He says, you're allowing this. You are allowing Jezebel to introduce two things. We talked about these a little bit last week, so I won't spend much time on it. But he says, first of all, you're allowing her to lead you astray into sexual immorality and into eating things sacrificed to idols. We could put them in large categories that it's a moral corruption, sexual immorality, and it's a religious or spiritual corruption. And they always go hand in hand. I mean, they really just do. That to, to, to be led astray away from truth will always, always affect our morality. And to be led into immorality will always affect our understanding of truth. And it's the idea, it's, it's you're allowing this to happen. You're allowing you know, this to happen into your world, you're allowing this moral corruption, you're allowing this religious corruption, you're allowing these things to happen, and I just want to pause again and just tell you how incredibly serious this is. I mean, Jesus is diagnosing it. I hope you're just hearing it, you get it, but I can't help but find myself thinking about when Jesus would talk about it. 
and talk about it different ways, but in perhaps one of the most ominous places in Matthew 18, he says, whoever causes one of these little ones, his believers, my servants, Jesus is saying, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Yeah, those are Jesus' words. <laughs> I just, I just wait, he says, if you're going to be one who's going to be a voice that you say you're speaking for me and you're not speaking for me, and you're going to encourage people to sin, he says, you're, you're in so much trouble. <laughs> it would be so much better if you just hung you know, a, a weight around your neck and threw yourself into the sea because that would be so much better than where you stand before me, Jesus is saying. And I'm just telling you again, he means that. And that's, that's the Jesus that we find here, and he's diagnosing this, and it's not something that he takes lightly. And so because of that, he gives warnings. Now, it's a little bit out of sync, uh, if I can say it that way, for you guys who've been with us every week, and so now this is your fourth week on, on the churches. You might be aware of that most of the time the warnings have come after the prescription, that Jesus gives the prescription of what they need to do, and then he gives them a warning if they don't do it. He mixes it together, but actually gives the warning first in this church, which is somehow significant. Now, on your page, I have it down as two warnings, but this is what happens when you like, make the note sheet and then continue. It's like, actually, it's three warnings. So I'm going to fix it on the screen. I can't fix it on your sheet. If, don't even know how you'll find room for it if you're trying to write it. But there are three different warnings because they are to three different people. Let's read them. There you have it, just to begin picking it up in verse 21. And I gave her, Jezebel, time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. So he says, okay, here's my first warning. Jezebel, she's going into a sickbed. She's going to go into a sickbed, that he's going to allow that to happen. This is a discipline and a weakness. And I just going to tell you that God does that. We could look through the Old Testament and, and New as well, and we'll find there are times when God disciplines even through sickness that whether it be Miriam, who is Aaron's, you know, just sister who gets leprosy, or Uzzah, the king who gets leprosy, or whether it be in 1 Corinthians where it talks about that sickness comes, and there's just a place where sickness can be a form of God's discipline. But catch this, catch this. Anytime there's discipline, there's hope. I mean, he doesn't just immediately just put her away. He's disciplining in a sense to bring back. I mean, you can respond to discipline well. Not everybody does. But Jesus just says, I'm going I'm to cast her into a sickbed. I'm going to deal with her specifically. Not just her, but also her partners. He says, those who commit adultery with her, those who are a part of this false teaching, who are bringing in this moral, spiritual corruption, he says, I'm going to just allow them to go into great tribulation. It is, again, discipline. I don't want to just get lost in this, but there are some that, that are just find themselves interesting that he uses the word great tribulation because we're going to talk about it in a few weeks. There is a great tribulation coming, a seven-year period of time that Jesus defines as the worst period of history that mankind has ever known. It hasn't come yet. Some think that he's making a reference to that here, saying that these are those who are not going to be raptured. These are those who are going into the tribulation. That is a possibility. That said, the word the is not before this. The definite, so it's not talking probably just necessarily about the great tribulation, but it's just going to get really bad for him. He's going to allow trials and troubles to discipline those who are part of this, and that's serious. Now, all of that's hard to hear, and yet it's important to hear because it lets us know, again, Jesus is one who will discipline his people. He is one who is a father who will discipline his people. But then he says something that if you just read this all by itself, it could leave you troubled for a very, very long time. But let's try. You notice what it says there, that is he's saying it in verse 23. I will kill her children with death. 
So now we have those who are her children. He's going to kill with death, and that just sounds scary. I mean, I don't know about anybody else. It's like, what? What, what, what do you, Jesus is going to kill her children with death? I mean, what is that saying? But let me give it to you clearly, because don't go wrong with this. This isn't a morbid thing, but it is actually one of the scariest statements that could ever be said. What is he saying? Well, he's saying they're not saved. That death is going to win in their lives. He's saying that her children are not his children. That they are children of Jezebel. They're children of this church. But they're not his. Now, track with me for a moment. And if I can do this well, I'll just, it's going to make it more clear. This is the, one of the scariest realities to me in the whole Bible. It is one of the scariest statements in the whole Bible that there are people who are very religious and very unsaved. And, and their religion is, is what they're hoping in, but it's not going to be there. Jesus would talk to the Pharisees this way, who were doing it religiously. He says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You are keeping people from going to heaven. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. He says, what, you, what you're doing is keeping people out of heaven. You're, you're keeping them from that. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel land and sea to win one proselyte, to have one convert. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. He says, those who buy into your understandings, they're going to hell. And that's incredibly scary. Jesus would say it this way at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, many are going to say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, <laughs> have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and we've done many wonders in your name? Look at all these good things we're a part of. That's the church in Thyatira, right? They have a lot of good things going. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. To me, it's one of the scariest statements in all of Scripture. Just this place of just recognizing that death wins. Can I say it to you in a different way? Hey, Christian, if you're a believer in Christ, death is never going to win. Death has lost its sting for you. We get to, we, death doesn't, de- is not our ultimate defeat. Death has is, is, is been defeated by Christ. But for these ones who are children of this church and not children of God, death wins. And I, I hate that. I just, it just grieves me. I mean, I, I, I there are people who choose to walk away from God and live their life in whole rebellion. That's easier for me than the person who's religious their whole life. And yet they're not saved. I mean, that's just the scary thing, and that's what he's saying. And yet Jesus says this, I am, to all the churches may know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Now, if you're paying attention, this is connecting back into what we learned about Jesus. He's got that penetrating vision. He's got the eyes like the flame of fire. He says, everybody's going to know I'm the one who does that. I search. I know what's really happening. I know people's lives. And I will give to each one according to your works. I have the feet of fine brass. I I give. I I deal with people in that way. I I do that. Peter would tell it to us this way. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? He says, if God deals with us in judgment, and he does... If the judgment of God, if Jesus has got these flaming eyes and feet of fine brass and he deals with us, and he does. How scary it is for those who don't know him. If you're here this morning and you don't know him, it's just incredibly scary. I'll just call you to Christ because he's the one that can save. And In fact, in 1 Peter goes on, it goes, says, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If you're one that is hoping that you're going to get into heaven because Jesus is lenient, if you're one that has bought into a lie, it's like, well, you know, Jesus wouldn't send me to hell. <laughs> Just, you know, I'm a pretty good person. You don't know Jesus. He deals with his church firmly. And if he deals with us firmly, how much scarier it is to be his enemy. Well, all that simply to say, that is this church. And so if we were to sum it up, we would say, okay, here's a church that is corrupting with just immorality and idolatry. Let's take just a quick moment, flip your page over for a second. One of the things we've talked about is that these seven churches are messages for us. We covered this in the first message on the seven churches, all the wording on this, so if you need to go back to it, you can get it. But one of the things we said is that by addressing seven churches, Jesus addresses all churches. 
that in our world today, every church is one of these seven. And there are churches that are compromising and corrupting. That's this church. Some of you just might want to write the corrupt church. Some of your Bibles will even have that little heading above it. But it really is a compromising, an allowing of evil church. And there are churches that are doing that today. And that's scary. Ought to be. Then one of the possibilities is it might be history. It's just a maybe, but one of the interesting things is that these things actually just dovetail into history really, really well. What season of history might this church represent? Well, that would represent from about 500 A.D. to 1,000 A.D. It's the beginning of the Dark Ages. It's the beginning of the Dark Ages, and literally in that 500 years, there's a whole lot that comes into the church that is from outside, just false practices that permeate even into this day. I'm not even going to tell you what they are because I don't want to make that a distraction. But I just want to tell you it's real. And it's one of those things that we need to understand, that those things happen and, and just to see that. That being said, let's flip back over to our front and say it this way. This was a real church in Jesus' day, and that's where they were. There are churches today that are this way. And the question for us is to ask that. It's like, okay, is this, is this speaking of us? Is this, is, this, is this speaking of us? And, and you know, a lot to say in this. Can I just say a couple of quick things? Are you being led astray by false teaching? That's, that's really the question you're going to have to ask right now. If you're actually paying attention, are you doing that? How do you know? Well, can I just give you three quick things? Ask Jesus. He's the one that has penetrating eyes and, and, and fl- feet of fine brass. You should ask him. Like, Lord, help me to, to, to discern between truth and error. That should be serious for you. You should compare it to the Bible. If it's not in this book, you should not embrace it. There shouldn't be something in your religious practice that you couldn't find here. But maybe the most important thing, I just want you to be sure that you're a child of God, not a child of a church. I want to tell you that what God is looking for is is that we would become the sons and daughters of God, not the sons and daughters of a church. And yet that's what he's telling us this church becomes. So if that's speaking into your life, it it really comes to us in different ways. And it's from that that Jesus gives us this prescription. And every one of the churches, he then prescribes, okay, this is what you need to do. And he does so in an interesting way. Would you just pick it up again? And we read through 22 to, to 25 a moment ago, but let's just notice it quickly. Verse 22, indeed, Jesus says, I will cast her into a sick bed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have until I come. Jesus does something that he hasn't done yet. He gives two different prescriptions. I'll say it this way, to those who are infected with this lie and those who are not infected. To to those who are infected and those who are not infected. The infected, he says, you need to repent. He says, I gave her time. I'm giving Jezebel, I'm giving the people time to repent, to turn from their sin. And if God is touching even your life this morning and you're like, I think I'm doing that. <laughs> I think I'm you know, letting Jezebel lead me astray. I have things that are not there. Hey, please do that while you still have time. Because that's what Jesus said when he was looking at this and describing them. He says in verse 21, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. Jesus is just. He is a judge, but he he is also patient. Romans would give it to us this way. Do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? When Jesus is patient, don't assume that's acceptance. Sometimes Jesus lets us get away with things for a little while, not because he's okay with them, and so someone's like, well, you know, he hasn't killed me yet. <laughs> you know, was a, if, he, if he's really wrong with what I was doing, I mean, maybe it's like, no, he's patient, but he's giving you time to repent. And if you hear that from him this morning, and that's what is resounding in your ears from him this morning, then turn away. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from those things that you've been led astray and Turn away from that false doctrine. If you're infected, then repent. 
But then Jesus says something interesting to those who are not infected. He says there are those there in the church in Thyatira who have not known this. Verse 24, it says, Now I say, to, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as don't have this doctrine, like you're in that church, but you don't have this. He says, I'm not going to give you any other burden. I am not laying anything else upon you. Just hold on. Just hold on, he says, verse 25, but hold fast what you have until I come. It's an amazingly gracious, wonderful place. And again, if it's you this morning that are doing well, hey, stay there. Stay there till Jesus comes back. Don't be led astray. False doctrine abounds. Don't be led astray. Hold on to what you have. Hey, quick aside. This is good instruction, but it strikes us here in 2018 maybe a little bit different than, than maybe it ought to. Because, see, we live in a different generation that has some incredible blessings, which also are incredible cursings. See, for you and I, if we are in a church that's teaching falsely, we should leave. <laughs> Go find another church. If you think that that's me, then you should leave. If you're in a church or in a church that's teaching falsely, you have choices, and you should go find a church that's teaching the truth. That's, what, that's the generation you and I live in. But understand this, what is possible for you and I, which has benefits and cursings, was not possible for most of church history, and it's not possible for everybody in our world. For much of church history, in their there was only one expression of the kingdom of God. There was only one place where you could find the Bible and find truth. And it wasn't possible to be like, leave the church. I mean, you're like, why didn't Jesus just tell him to leave the church? Because there were no other churches. Well, they just should have stayed home and read the Bible themselves. We didn't have that for 1,500 years of church history. The only place that people could get the truth many times was a compromised place. And the amazing thing is that in those places, God was still working. And again, there's something there where he's just telling them, hey, you're a part of something, and, and just you stay to the truth, avoiding the error all the way around you. And for some of you, there's actually special meaning in that for you. But it is there. So inflicted, infected, excuse me, repent, uninfected, hold fast. That is his encouragement. But then Jesus gets to the end of the letter. You can flip your little notebook over and you come to this place where he ends every letter with this call, this place where it is a promise to those who are hearing. And again, this letter is a little different because he reorients it. If you've been tracking with us, it, there's been a certain pattern for the first three letters that flowed precisely. It's all there. There are three things in this closing place that are always there, but they're just in different order. Let's read that. It's there in verse 26 to 29. And he who overcomes and keeps my work until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I have also received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To this church, the first thing he calls is them to be overcomers. Up to this point, that's been command number two in the other letters. But this one, it's first, and maybe tying into what he just said, because he just said, hang on, hold fast what you have. And it's a call to personally overcoming. And the reality is this, that Jesus is looking at you and you alone right now. We're not talking about churches or people. We're talking about you, and he's telling you, you need to overcome. This is for you personally. Overcome. Stay, keep your works to the end. You stay all the way till Jesus comes back. That's how you want your life to go. And it's, it's a call to do that in light of what he's just said. And then in that, he gives a promise. And he gives two promises here. Promises that are meant to encourage. When he gives these promises, he highlights things that are true of every Christian. But highlighting things that God is going to do in our lives that will help us to, to see that. His first one, he says, I'm going to give you power. It says, I will give you power over the nations. To him who overcomes and keeps my work, in verse 20, I will give power over the nations. What is this? Well, this is the millennium. It's a thousand years coming when Jesus is going to rule and reign, which is prophesied in Psalm 2, which is what he quotes from here. In verse 27, it is a quote where God says that he's going to you know, give that to Jesus. Now, we'll talk more about the millennium later in the book of Revelation, 
but I'm also just going to be honest. I don't entirely understand the millennium. <laughs> I mean, maybe nobody does because we've never been there. But it is going to be a time when Jesus rules and reigns on this earth. Before heaven, before sin is all the way done with, fulfilling many, many Old Testament prophecies. And there's a lot of things I don't understand, but here's what I want you to understand he's telling us. For us who are believers, we're going to be a part of that administering justice with him. We have a role in the millennium. I don't even know what that looks like. I just know it's there. But please catch it. For this church, it's connecting because basically it's telling them, hey, where you are right now, which is God dealing with you in justice, where Jesus is the one who, who is with these you know, bright eyes and brass feet dealing, you're going to be on the other side of it. You're not going to be the one receiving his judgment. You're going to be helping administer that judgment. And there's something powerful there. There's something there where God's going to tell us, hey, that which we're learning now, it's going to flow out then in a very different way. Really, it's meant to be an encouragement, and it is, if you can catch it. But then the second just promise is even more precious. He ends that, and he says, you know, Jesus gets that, as I've received from my Father at the end of verse 27, which is the promise of reigning in the millennium. And in verse 26, sorry, verse 28, he says, and I will give him the morning star. He says, I'm going to give you the morning star. What's the morning star? What's the morning star? Well, the morning star, it's a term used throughout the Bible. It's how we're going we're to see it again at the end of Revelation. It's a description of the sun when it's just cresting over the horizon. When you look over at, 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 at a mountain and the sun just begins to peek over at the beginning of a brand new day, it's a new beginning. It's, it's the dawning of a new day. And it's a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of heaven. That Jesus is writing to this church. He says, I'm going to give you heaven. I'm going to give you a brand new day. You're gonna, you, he's giving to them hope that this broken world isn't going to be forever. And once more, there's a definite connection to the criticism and, and critique that Jesus has, has had to bring. He's been writing to people that he said, you're not really my children. Death is going gonna, is gonna to defeat so many. But if you overcome, if you don't fall prey to that and you are his, that's not true of you. There's a new day when death is over, when a new day begins, when there's no more sin, no more pain, no more sorrow, and no more death. It's a beginning of a new day. We're going to be there. And I just want to tell you, that is incredible hope to this church and to you and to me. And so he ends it. In this last statement at the end of chapter 2, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Every letter has this inclusion. Hey, God is talking. Are you listening? Even if this is not you entirely. Hopefully this is not our church, though God knows. But in this message, he's had something for us. He says, if you're listening, the Holy Spirit's talking. To him who has ears to hear, you should hear that. And that really becomes really a key part in the end of this, that we give you space at the bottom of your little notebook thing to say, okay, what was it for you? What was it for you? I mean, I don't know what it is. Maybe, again, just to make sure you see Jesus this way. Hey, let's quickly review. We think about everything we've just talked about this morning. We think about this message to Thyatira. You can open up your little booklet, and, and I want to tell you the summary statements that we gave. You might want to write them down. We don't have time to do it now because I'm going to go through this quickly. But what have we learned this morning? That Jesus is the divine, all-seeing judge. That's what we've learned. This church, he's looked upon them, and he said, hey, you know, there is a church that they are doing incredible good. They, they did a lot of good, but at the same point, they were corrupted with immorality and idolatry. They absolutely permeated them, and so he gives a prescription, which was to repent, if that's you. If it's not you, hold fast. Hold fast. His warnings were serious of a discipline and death for those that wouldn't just heed this. But then he gets to the promises that are all the way at the end, that he says, okay, if you're going to respond well to this, then you're going to be with Jesus in the millennium, and you're going to be with Jesus in the new heaven and new earth. I mean, those things are our incredible hope. So in all that this was, I guess I just want to end this morning as we've ended each week in one sense, saying, okay, what was this? 
I mean, we've covered a lot of things this morning, and yet I just know this, that the Holy Spirit has been trying to talk to you and you alone. And I hope this morning that that's not obscure to you. I hope that right now you just like, okay, lots of information, but there's one thing God has said to me this morning. I just want you to know that. So let's close together in prayer. Would you join me? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is good and true and right and rich. And Lord, as we gaze upon you and, and, and consider all that you are and, and all that you're doing, I just want to thank you that you are the one who is true. Jesus, you see, you're dealing, we recognize that. And I pray, oh, I pray that you'd help us to be those who respond to you well. We pray for that together right now. In Jesus' name, amen.